to the audience. Boy, we look like some apostles in Gethsemane right about now. Long week, getting ready for the week of head, and I understand that. So I'm not going to be as foolish to think 
that I'm going to sit up here and hold you for 47 minutes. Maybe 42, praise God. I'm just playing. Say amen for I change my mind. Lord have mercy. It's good to see Brother Martin back. Uh, understand that he was treated um, with great respect and, and um, was hosted well in the MacArthur Park um, congregation. And I want to extend my sincere appreciation for all the kind words and encouragement that I got earlier today from the sermon that was preached this morning. And as promised, I'm going to give you the part two. Now, y'all heard one verse read, and y'all was like, all right. That's what I'm talking about, one verse, just to break down. So let's, let's jump right into this, why don't we? Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 20. And I'll read this again just for the sake of emphasis. And I'll be reading from the King James transliteration of the Bible. <clears throat> teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, this morning we had discussed that this was the chapter in Matthew that we know, hear about the Lord being resurrected. Namely, in this context, starting in verse 16, um, you will find what is known as the Great Commission. The commission itself is found in verses 19 through 20, and 20, that is. It has those four components that we discussed this morning. The idea of go, teach, baptize, and teach. That's the four components of the Great Commission. But however, I want to bring your attention by way of remembrance that the first teaching that we deal with in verse number 19 is the idea of making disciples. We dealt with that with that acronym cost, commitment, obedience, sacrifice, and trust. Making disciples is that first piece of the teaching as coupled with the first principles that one needs to know about Jesus and what he sacrificed that we may have access in order to be Christians. That's all part of that first teaching. We discussed the baptizing. That's the consummating piece, if you will. The point of finality of us going from being outside of Christ to being into Christ. That there is no way to get into Christ doctrinally speaking, without being baptized. Now it's important to note that because in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 10, the Bible is explicit when it explains to us that salvation is found in Christ. So if you want to have salvation, you have to be what salvation is. And that is in Christ. So when you talk to folk who say, I don't want to be baptized, then the question you ask them is, then what do you do to get into Christ? And the only way into Christ, according to Galatians 3.27, is baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, it is only through baptism. So this baptism piece is very important. It's crucial when it comes to salvation. But then, after the baptizing, in verse 20, we have this second teaching, if you will. As a continuation of the teaching that comes from the doctrine of Christ. But watch this. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Here's where we're going to hang out for the rest of our time. I was asked a question earlier this week, and it was the fifth time I was asked this question. Visitors say, we came by the congregation. Smiley faces, good handshakes. We enjoy the preaching. We appreciate the hospitality. We love the praise. But I got one question for you. Where in the world is the piano? That was the question. 
why is it that every church of Christ I go to, I can't find any mechanical instruments anywhere in the building? Well, some would say this is just how we do. But that's not the answer. Some would say that's how I was taught. But that is not the answer. The answer is found within this verse that we're reading tonight. The idea that Christ gave explicit commands on what the apostles are to teach. You guys remember in Acts 2.42, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And the apostles' doctrine is not different or separate from Christ's doctrine. The apostles' doctrine is Christ's doctrine based upon what Christ taught the apostles. Are y'all with me? So now we, we see that Christ taught some things. And when people walk in looking for something that cannot be read in the New Testament, you have to necessarily infer that Christ didn't teach it, so the apostles didn't teach it, so therefore you can't read it, so therefore you should not be doing it. Simple enough? And as a matter of fact, I love 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16, where it talks about the all scriptures given by the inspiration of God. Now, now, now that terminology, inspiration of God, is a powerful piece of scripture. It literally means, watch this, that it is God breathed. It's God breathed. Now, me and Peter was laughing about this sometime last week, and let me tell you this. Whatever you do and endorse for your acts towards God, if God did not breathe it, then you might not want to inhale it. Does that make sense? If you can't read where God authorized it, then you should not be doing it. That's the reason why. But then when it comes to music and worship, well, I tell you, there's a reason. While we sing. You know, I love the songwriter who said that they sing because they're happy. They sing because they're free. The eye was on the sparrow, and that was the reason why they sing. I love the fact that we can all join together and we can sing about having a little talk to Jesus because that is showing us the power of our prayer life. I love the fact we can stand up loud and proud and sing, I am redeemed, I'm brought with a price. Jesus had changed my whole life. It's a reason. It's a reason why we're singing. There's a therapy that's involved in that. I was encouraged when Brother Davis led because he lives on this morning. There's therapy in that. And we sing that. We don't play it. We don't pluck it, but we sing it because that's all God has asked us to do. If you don't believe me, listen to these verses. I'm in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 19. Full of, what does the Bible read? Speaking to one another with psalms, uh -huh. hymns, uh -huh. and psalms. Now stop right there. So now the, the, the text says, speaking, watch this, speaking to one another. Now, this is not a demonstration of me not having rhythm and doing the bad dance. But I'm showing you what one to another means. It means to reciprocate. One to another. That what I do towards Raleigh, Raleigh is doing towards me while we're doing it together for God. That's what one to another means. That means that I have to be doing the exact same thing that Raleigh is doing. So if I'm singing, Raleigh is singing, now we're singing up to God. But then what if Raleigh is playing? What if Raleigh is plucking? He's plucking, I'm singing, that's two different things, no reciprocation. Make sense? That's the reason why we sing and sing alone. How about Hebrews chapter 13 and verse in verse number 15, when it comes to the idea of praising God, well, what, what do we use?
to praise God? Do we use a drum? Do we use a guitar? What do we use to praise God? According to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, what does the Bible read? Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice uh -huh. of praise, uh -huh. the fruit of lips. The fruit of what? Lips. What? Lips. He's not stuttering. I'm trying to make a point. The fruit of the lips is what we use to praise God. Not the pounding of the drum, not the plucking of the guitar, not the pushing of the keys, but the fruit of the lips. Now, watch this. This is what Jesus taught, so therefore the apostles taught it, so therefore we practice it. And this is in line with Matthew 28, 20. Anything that you see practice in the church, filter it through Matthew 28, 20. Always ask the question, did Jesus teach that? Did an apostle teach that? If not, why is it being done? That's the line of doctrinal reason. Now, I could have went to Colossians 3, 17 and showed you that whatsoever you do in word and deed, do it all by the authority of Christ. I could have broke down that word authority and said the only thing you do must be authorized by Christ. I could have went that route also, but this is simpler. Matthew 28 and verse number 20. When it comes to what we do for salvation, Matthew 28 makes it simple. What did Jesus teach when they came to be insane. Well, we already covered the fact of making disciples. Jesus taught that, so you have to be taught before you are converted. Well, what else did Jesus teach? Well, if you have one of those fancy Bibles that has the red letters, um, you can follow this line of reasoning, and you will see what Jesus taught. You will see in Mark 16, 15, Jesus taught that the gospel had to be preached. That's just what Jesus taught. And was Jesus wrong? Of course not. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus taught you have to believe the gospel. Was Jesus wrong? Of course not. In Luke 13, 3, Jesus taught the necessity of repentance. Was Jesus wrong? Of course not. In Matthew 10, 32, Jesus taught the necessity of confessing him before man. Was Jesus wrong? Of course not. In John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5, he taught the principle of baptism by describing it by being born again through the spirit and the water. Was Jesus wrong? Of course not. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 22, he taught that the one who endure until the end shall be saved. Was Jesus wrong? Of course not. So when you walk in here and you ask the question, well, why in the world are we hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized? Because in spirit of Matthew 28 and verse number 20, it's apparent that Jesus taught the apostles. The apostles penned it. We read and study it, so therefore we do it. Make sense? It's almost a little too simple. Because that's how God designed it. Now, now, now for, now for y'all, if, if this is your first time hearing me preach in the evening, I do turn to a teacher versus a preacher. And I really want these fundamental things to be understood so that way our faith can be fortified that when we're challenged on the things that we do, challenged on the things that we believe, that we have book, chapter, verse, and context to stand upon, and we don't have to say, you gotta call the preacher, or we don't gotta say, we just do it this way. Right. No, you have book, chapter, and verse to the back of everything you do. Why is it that we take communion every first day of the week? Because Acts 27, the Lord taught the apostles, the apostles wrote it, we studied, so we do it. Why do we leave an offering on the first day of the week? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, exact same process. Why do we pray without ceasing? Exact same process. Why do we preach the word? Exact same process. If you can filter it through God's word, then you're on to something. But if you can't filter it through God's word, that's where you have a problem. You see, everything that's a good idea is not an authorized idea. Let me give you an example. By show of hands, who would love during communion to see some good cheeseburgers and root beer? And, 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 and for those who healthy, turkey burgers. 
and root beer. Boy, uh, uh, veggie burger, talk sir. Hey, you're showing now for this wife. Veggie burger, talk sir. Boy, attendance will be at all time high. Free lunch. But that's not what's authorized. We have to stick to the book. We have to filter things through the book. And we have to have the authority of Christ for everything that we do because as he said in chapter 18 in Matthew 28, that all authority was given unto him. And that authority does not extend only to Christian folk, but it extends to all folk. If that was only for Christians only, then God would be an unjust God when he judged those who has not obeyed the gospel of Christ. So since God is in a position to judge those who have been disobedient to his gospel, then we have to necessarily infer that God is over all. If you like it, or if you don't like it. And he is the authorized spokesperson for God, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Now, y'all know this dramatic pause means something. It's time to bring it on home. I've already gave the plan of salvation. Now, y'all waiting for me to jump up and down, get sway and excited, and start walking up the aisle and spend 20 more minutes here, ain't you? But that's not going to happen tonight. I just wanted to hit my point and sit down. And I really want us to have this, this, this gradual, fundamental teaching that everything that we do must be filtered through the Bible, the Word of God. And did you know that even when it comes to your personal solace, your safety, and your protection, that's also filtered through God's word? Did you know that when you're going through problems of depression and anxiety, that God tells you explicitly not to be anxious, to worry not, but in all things through fear and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God? He tells you to do that. But not only does he tell you to do that, what is powerful, he gives you the benefit behind doing it. He says, the peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> Have you ever been so happy and full of joy where you just can't stop smiling? It's like you got an extra tooth in your mouth and you just can't stop. You just can't turn it off for some reason. And folks walk up to you, they were like, hi, weirdo, why are you smiling so much? Right? Because I got so much joy. Uh, I may not be happy because all my circumstances around me may not be all nice and rosy, but I just got so much joy that I have to smile every time you see me. How is every day a good day? Because I woke up this morning, so I glory and have joy in that. I walk to the refrigerator. See, 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 I didn't say refrigerator. I said the refrigerator. Uh, 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 Y'all know what a refrigerator is. Uh, when you open it sometimes, all you see in there is lettuce, potatoes, and water. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's only my house, praise God. Okay, wait, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's a refrigerator. But in there, I saw some sausage, some eggs, a gallon of juice with this much juice left in it. Just enough for me. I got joy. You see, it's those little things that we have to embrace, understanding that everyone doesn't have the ability to have a sound mind. Everyone doesn't have the movement of all their limbs. Everyone doesn't have family to love and to hug and to kiss. I have a wife to kiss. I have children to reprimand. I have daughters to high five. I have a sister-in-law in whom I love so much I call her my sister. That's a blessing. And for that, Mr. Weirdo, here I come. I got a smile. And maybe there's something going on in your life that has caused you to lose your smile. But did you know that God's in the blessed business? That God can help you get your smile back? Or you can just listen to that new Pharrell song, and that make you happy too, doesn't it? Mm, oh, that's only me. Oh, I got you. Halo, rubber wings, my bad. Mm. Mm -hmm. But if you lost your smile, if you're discouraged about something, let us know about that. We don't want to know your business. We just want to share in this with you to get you where you know God wants you to be. That's all we want to do.
we're in this thing together because right now I may be up and you may be down, but guess what? Boy, when them doors swing the other way, I'm sure going to need you. So it would be prudent for me to assist you, to put you in the position to assist me, that when we both are going well, we are in a position to assist other folks who are all around us. That's what a family does. And that's what it's all about. So I ain't going to mess with you too much, though. But if there is something that has caused you to lose your smile, we are asking and begging that you let it be known. As we all stand and sing the Lord's song, the invitation. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us. Trust and 